Great mothers, I shall once again require the aid of your dark magic. The thread of destiny demands it. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Ahsoka Episode 6 video. There were a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, like some real big deep cuts, especially for Night Sisters in the Star Wars universe, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. We're also doing a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and just post your favorite moment from the episode on the video. There were so many big reveals in this episode. This was like another top tier episode during the season, like next to the Anakin Skywalker Hayden Christensen return. But careful for spoilers, if you haven't seen the episode yet, we'll just start at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments. Starting with the episode title, Far, Far Away, which is obviously a reference to the other galaxy, Peridia. It's also a reference to the Star Wars intros to all the movies a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But in the context of the episode, Dave Filoni does this really clever kind of retcon where he makes it seem like Hu Yang is the person telling all the stories of the Star Wars universe long after everyone has died. Tell me one of those stories. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Pretty much everybody watching the episode just went full meme the minute that they heard him say that. But overall, the episode was mostly a Thrawn episode and a Night Sisters episode. Like, obviously, the big thing here was finding Ezra Bridger, but it was just like one reveal on top of like 10 big reveals. The actual intro starts with Ahsoka in the Purgal pod traveling through hyperspace, just showing you what it looks like when they're traveling through hyperspace from their perspective. It looks way more dynamic too, like they tuned up the special effects for hyperspace travel from a lot of the previous Star Wars movies and TV shows, even like the newer Disney Star Wars sequels. Hyperspace travel just looks way crazier now. Just a little while ago, at the beginning of The Mandalorian Season 3, we saw Grogu witnessing the Purgles while they were traveling through hyperspace. It looked way less cool than it does in this scene here. Like, Dave Floyd, like, really pumped this up. It looks like the Purgles are able to travel through hyperspace because something in their biology generates a special field around their bodies necessary to enter hyperspace. Like, when a regular spaceship enters hyperspace, it has this little bubble that it generates around it. The Purgles seem like they can just do that naturally, like something inside them does that. The other interesting thing, too, is that they can hover in midair inside a planet's atmosphere. Later in the episode, when you see Thrawn's Chimera doing that, just like hovering over the tower, which seems like another big Lord of the Rings Easter egg. I'll get to that in a second, too. Normally, it takes an extreme amount of energy for Star Destroyers to hover like that inside planets' atmospheres because of all the gravitational forces. So something about the Purgle's biology just lets them do that just naturally. Normally in outer space, though, your mass doesn't actually matter because there's no actual resistance exerting any force against you. Hu Yang and Ahsoka talk about their history in the Jedi Order and how Hu Yang used to tell history stories about the history of the galaxy to all the Padawans he came across, including Ahsoka, when she was a Padawan. They call it Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3. Part 3 would be like everything up to just before the events of the prequels. Part 1 would basically be like everything from the Star Wars version of the Big Bang, when the Star Wars universe was created, up to the beginning of sentient species learning to travel through space. Part 2 history of the galaxy would probably be something like the rise of the Night Sisters, ancient empire, like the ancient witch kingdom of the Dath Miri, as Balan Skull calls it, which seems like a Lord of the Rings reference, like make another Witch King of Angmar reference. There's also a lot of really crazy green magic energy in Lord of the Rings that the Witch King uses, the Night Sisters also use. They call it magic, but it's spelled a little bit differently. That part of history would just cover the rise of that empire, them building all the star maps, the waypoint henges. That part of history would probably end with the Night Sisters being stranded in the main galaxy, or some of the Night Sisters, because obviously some of them stayed in that old galaxy. Then the beginning of the Old Republic era, and then up to part three would be like everything from the Old Republic, the fall of that, the creation of the High Republic era, the rise and fall of the ancient Sith Empire, right up until the events of the prequels. Because remember, if Ahsoka heard part three when she was a Padawan, when she first came to the temple, that would have been before the events of Phantom Menace. Hu Yang is basically teeing up all this ancient history stories because we're getting ready to see that part of the other galaxy, Peridia, basically where this story came from when he says a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Obviously, probably one of the biggest references in all of Star Wars, but he's making it sound like the history of the main galaxy started in this older galaxy. So like the Night Sisters, this ancient witch kingdom of the Dath Miri came to the main universe and that was the beginning of history in the main galaxy as we think of it. Now, I talked about how Dave Filoni is making it seem like Hu Yang is the person reciting all these stories based in the Star Wars movie intros. Like, oh, he's the person that's telling the stories of things that happened during the events of these movies. 
But when George Lucas wrote the original movies, he envisioned that the story came from the Journal of the Wills, these creatures here, and it was the Wills who were recording the history of the galaxy and retelling things long after everyone had died. But I do like the idea that Hu Yang just outlives everyone, like, into the vast, vast future and continues to tell the story like History of the Galaxy Part 4, and that's everything that we're seeing unfold right now in present day. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, a creature named Grogu came along and birthed a brand new Jedi Order. They talk a little bit about Sabine and the troubling visions that Ahsoka had seeing her go with Balin willingly, but understanding that she did it to save Ezra like it was all because of Ezra. Even though she and Thrawn also makes fun of Sabine later in person because of this, saying that she's basically doomed the main galaxy to have another Star War. Thrawn was kind of making fun of her when he was telling that to her like, ah, you've doomed your entire galaxy just to save your friend. You've gambled the fate of your galaxy. On that belief. When Hu Yang starts talking about Force visions being unclear, like the Force can show you things, but it's always unclear as to what they actually mean. That's a reference to both like Luke Skywalker's Force visions and Anakin Skywalker's Force visions. So in the cave on Dagobah, Luke saw himself becoming Darth Vader, and all the vision was meant to show him was that ultimately he would have to make a choice when he faced Darth Vader and the Emperor, and depending on what he chose to do, he could wind up becoming the next Darth Vader, replacing him as the Emperor's apprentice. And in Anakin's Force visions, when he saw Padme, Luke, and Leia dying, it was only a vision of something that might happen in the future, but Anakin believed that it was a certainty, causing him to make the wrong choice and back the Emperor. George R. Martin kind of got into this whole concept in Game of Thrones universe when it came to prophecies. The whole idea is that prophecies and visions are always misinterpreted to disastrous consequences. Sabine wakes up in her holding cell in the hyperspace ring. Notices the round doors here. That kind of reminds me of the prequel design language a little bit more. I think it's also meant to be a reference to a lot of the Night Sisters' ancient design language because of the way that gold is baked into all their designs. Then we get a massive info dump. Like, this is a huge lore info dump, and it is amazing. Morgan Elsbeth basically explains the Night Sisters in a brand new context, like a whole bunch more lore than we got during the Clone Wars or even Star Wars Rebels. That is Peridia the ancient homeworld of my ancestors, the Dathomiri. She calls the actual planet that they arrive on Peridia, and it's the ancient home of the Night Sisters. When she calls them the Dathomiri, I think the idea is that the ancient Night Sisters came from this older galaxy to the new galaxy, then eventually colonized this planet, which they named Dathomir. And at some point, the ones that came to the new galaxy were stranded. I don't know how they're going to explain that. Like, why didn't they just use the space whales to get back to their original galaxy? Why did they stay in the main galaxy? But at some point, it seems like the Night Sisters in the main galaxy's power waned. Because of the way the Balin Skull and everyone talks about them, the ancient witch kingdom of the Dathmiri sounds like it was way, way bigger at one point. She says the Night Sisters were among the first people who were able to harness the power of the Purgles and ride them between galaxies, probably in the same way that Ahsoka made it back to this old galaxy by riding in ships inside their mouths. But now it makes more sense why the Emperor wanted the Night Sisters killed off in the main galaxy because they wouldn't serve him and submit, and because their power and abilities made them a huge threat to him. They make the Night Sisters seem way, way more powerful than they did during Clone Wars or during Star Wars Rebels. Like all the stuff that we knew about them before was just a fraction. This makes it seem like Dave Filoni is going to roll real hard on Night Sisters lore during the upcoming Thrawn movie, and I'll talk about that in a second too, because a big part of the episode reveals what Thrawn's plan is for his upcoming Star War against the New Republic. They also reveal that the Peridia planet is where the Purgles come to die, basically, when they get old enough, and there are just bones of them littered all around the atmosphere. When they're entering the atmosphere, you also see them pass a bunch of huge statues of ancient Night Sisters. Those are just the remnants of the ancient witch kingdom of the Dathmiri. Not sure how they fell, what happened to them. We'll probably learn that either in the next couple of episodes, like they'll tease that. There's not enough episodes to completely explain it, but they might leave some of that for the Thrawn movies in upcoming seasons of Ahsoka. They land on the Night Sisters version of that same star map hinge. It looks way cleaner, like it's well more maintained. And it's this giant tower structure that looks like it's right out of Lord of the Rings. Like you could either call this a version of Minas Tirith, like it looks a little bit like Gondor, but it also looks kind of like Baradur, Sauron's tower in Mordor. Like you could make a lot of Lord of the Rings references in Easter eggs here between the two series and the movies. Like Ahsoka is basically the Gandalf of the Star Wars universe. She went from being Ahsoka the Grey to Ahsoka the White, like Gandalf the Grey to Gandalf the White with the resurrection. There's the one ring of power in the Lord of the Rings universe. There's the giant hyperspace ring in Ahsoka. So this Peridia planet is kind of like the Star Wars version of Mordor in that equation. 
Some of you may have detected that the lead night sister here, like the great mother, is played by Claudia Black from Farscape, Stargate. She's done a bunch of stuff. Welcome, child of Dathomir. You do our ancestors credit. Ladies and gentlemen, the beautiful, the talented oh. Miss Claudia Black. Thank you. Hello. I play Officer Aaron's son. They haven't revealed too much about these individual different night sisters, but they're calling her Clotho. The other interesting thing here too is there's a bunch of Dune vibes coming off of these Night Sisters. The way they portray them in live action here is a lot like the Bene Gesserit in the Dune universe. They call them the Great Mothers like Reverend Mothers in the Bene Gesserit. The reason why they all know each other, like Morgan Elsbeth knows the Great Mothers even though they never met each other in person is because they spoke to each other through the weave that they talk about, like the loom, all these threads that they keep talking about, is the way that the Night Sisters perceive the Force. That also feels kind of like a wheel of time easter egg, like when you're talking about describing the force as a loom like threads, you talk about strands, patterns in the weave so to speak. That's something right out of the wheel of time series. Dave Filoni just like pulling out all the great epic works, bringing them back in. The other funny easter egg too is that in real life George Lucas was heavily inspired by Dune with some of the aspects of the Star Wars universe. They also look much more like traditional Night Sisters the way they portrayed them during the Clone Wars series. When the series began, they revealed that Morgan Elsbeth was a Night Sister. A lot of people were wondering why wasn't her skin white? Why didn't she have the Night Sister tattoos the same way? Part of the idea, I think, is that Thrawn, who she served in the main galaxy before Thrawn got exiled to the other galaxy with Ezra, the whole idea is that during the rise of the Empire, they basically killed off all the Night Sisters on Dathomir, but Morgan Elsbeth survived. Thrawn saved her and basically she served him throughout that whole period before the original trilogy started. What probably happened is that after he saved her, in order for her to continue operating freely within the Empire, he just told her to make herself look like a normal person, like get rid of the tattoos, don't walk around looking like a Night Sister. They clock Sabine, sense that she's dangerous because she is Jedi, giving off Jedi energy. The three devices that they trap her with also look like the exact same designs that were on the star map, confirming that the Night Sisters really did create that old technology designed for traveling between galaxies, but it was like distantly ancient Night Sisters. They start this weird subplot with Balin Skull kind of getting a little distant and nostalgic when he starts sensing this weird power, quote unquote, that's calling to him. He starts recounting his experiences during Order 66 to Shin Hati, the burning of the Jedi Temple, likening it to what's happening in present day now with the upcoming war that Thrawn will start. The important thing though is that he says that his grand plan is to stop that cycle and something on this planet, some power, will help him do that. That sounds pretty hardcore, like how do you stop all war from happening ever? We'll see how that winds up manifesting. It could involve something with the world between worlds and that's probably why they included it in the early episodes with all the Anakin Skywalker stuff like, oh, watch this now, it'll be cool, but it'll be super important for later. Balin also says that the stories that he heard about Peridia as a child in the Jedi Temple were critical to him developing his plan, but we don't know what those stories are. So there's like some hidden information that Dave Filoni hasn't given us yet that'll probably reveal what his actual plan is and what that entails. Then Thrawn finally returns in his Chimera Star Destroyer, and you know it's Thrawn's because it has his symbol underneath it just like during Star Wars Rebels, and it still has the damage from the Purgles that you saw at the end of Star Wars Rebels. Now patched with that same gold medal that it seems like Morgan Elspeth used to design the giant hyperspace ring and smaller dropships, like basically Night Sister design language. Love the way they show him lowering the Star Destroyer onto the top of the tower so that he can literally just walk up like it's such a boss ass move. But if we're making Baradur, Sauron, Lord of the Rings references here, he would be the Eye of Sauron, like he is Sauron himself. There's so many things that you could talk about in the scene of him rolling up to. Like you notice his Star Destroyer's Legion has a bunch of red markings for the Night Scissors on them, but their armor is all damaged, dirty, broken, and repaired with that same gold metal. So the early theory is that they're also Night Sister zombies like Maroc was. There's also this talk about this later in the episode too, their plan to ferry a bunch of cargo from the catacombs to the new galaxy, basically a bunch of dead bodies that they're going to turn into Night Sister zombies. And it looks like Thrawn has depended heavily on the Night Sister's powers to do that and their other force abilities. The leader commanding them has a special Night Sister design golden mask and part of his armor has been repaired with gold metal. His name is Enoch and he's played by Wes Chatham who was Amos on The Expanse. Notice that they give Thrawn his own theme music and there is a little bit of Star Wars Rebels music that they mix into the episode too. Then we see Thrawn roll up in live action for the first time and it's Lars Mikkelsen playing the character who was the voice of Thrawn during the animated Star Wars Rebels series. Just another example of an animated character doing their character in live action, kind of like Bo-Katan. 
There are a lot of characters in the live action Star Wars series that are like that now. Not everybody, like there's some recastings like Ezra Bridger is played by a brand new actor. Sabine Wren is played by a brand new actor. Obviously Ahsoka was Ashley Eckstein in the animated version and it's Rosario Dawson in the live action version. Most of you probably remember Lars Mikkelsen from Sherlock with Benedict Cumberbatch. He's only changed Thrawn just a little bit in his performance from animation to live action. He said the way he did the animated voice just didn't work in live action, like it was a little too silly, so he just toned it down a little bit. I will start my operations here and pull the rebels apart piece by piece. They'll be the architects of their own destruction. What was first just a dream has become a frightening reality for those who may oppose us. But it does sound very similar to his animated version and obviously a bunch of time has gone by since the events of Rebels and I think you could explain him just weighing a little bit more because he's got so many more city miles. Like it's been a little while like he's gone through some crap in this other galaxy so he's got a few extra city miles on him. There are a lot of people that were making Elon Musk jokes after the trailers of him drop but I think they tuned him a little bit by the time this episode came out that he actually looks pretty decent like what you would expect them to do but I think it'll probably get better by the time we get to that Thrawn movie. Kind of the way that their Luke Skywalker deep fake got better from The Mandalorian Season 2 to The Book of Boba Fett and then the next time we'll see Luke Skywalker, like they'll just keep getting better with their technology. I've done a bunch of backstory videos about Thrawn's origin, why he's so feared, even amongst other members of the Empire. Basically the idea is that Anakin Skywalker bumped into him accidentally during the events of the Clone Wars. Thrawn learns about the threat of the Emperor and the expanding Empire and wants to save his people the Chiss who live in the unknown regions. So he agreed to serve the Emperor in exchange for star maps of the unknown regions like map portions of really important parts of space that the Empire or the rest of the galaxy didn't have yet. In exchange the Emperor would leave that part of the Chiss space although like he wouldn't touch their Empire so everything that Thrawn did like all of his cunning military strategy devoted to expanding the Empire serving the Emperor was really in service of saving his people the Chiss. Thrawn is basically meant to be the most brilliant military mind in the history of the galaxy, like the smartest person alive, best battle commander you could ever have. But everything he's done, like all the terrible stuff that he's done, has nothing to do with the Emperor. Like he doesn't care about the Emperor, he doesn't care about the Empire, he only wants to save his people, the Chiss. So that I can bombard the civilians of your home without incurring Imperial casualties. Just so that you understand that my intentions are genuine. I shall demonstrate my power. Civilian casualties outnumbered the insurgents at the time. Acceptable margins, Agent Callus. That's why during Star Wars Rebels, during like a lot of his engagements, like when he would go into battle, he would threaten a lot of collateral damage. Like I'll just burn, kill everyone on the planet and I don't care about them because he only cares about the Chiss. He doesn't even really care about his own men that much either. Like they're just pawns to him. Kind of the way that he doesn't care about Balan's skull or Shin Hati. Like, you know what? Let's just cut him loose. Who cares about him? But everyone on the Shadow Council that we saw in The Mandalorian, like the Remnant Empire, even though they all kind of hate each other a little bit, each one thinks that they're the best person to lead this next empire like Moff Gideon wants to lead it himself. Pretty much all of them agree that Thrawn is their best option, the smartest person in the room that can help them retake the galaxy. So when Sabine is yelling at Thrawn saying that you wouldn't understand what it means dooming my galaxy just to save my friend, like I care about my friend that much, you just don't understand it, Thrawn gets pissed off at her. That's why, because he did all this stuff like he served the Emperor just to save his people. Normally you don't see him actually getting mad, like that's his whole thing, like he's completely unperturbed by pretty much everything, but every once in a while you do get to see him lose his cool. So the idea is that yes, Thrawn does care about some people, but it's just his own people to chiss. Maybe, maybe we'll see more of them during the Thrawn movie. Like I said, the cargo transfer that he talks about his agreement with the Great Mothers of the Night Sisters is basically transporting all the dead bodies of the Night Sister catacombs that Thrawn will take to the main galaxy, they'll raise those, and those Night Sister zombies will be their brand new army. My early theory about the Night Sisters stranding themselves in the main galaxy on the planet Dathomir might have something to do with that green magic energy. Like maybe there was just a great source of it in the main galaxy, and that's why they stayed. They basically need that energy to resurrect all these people, like they need that special power. It's something that you actually find inside Dathomir's core. So it's kind of this special force type of energy that only they are able to wield. It's not something that exists on every single planet. There are a couple cool scenes of Thrawn sizing up Balan's skull like, ah, oh, I remember you General Balan's skull from the Clone Wars because basically all the Jedi got military ranks during that, like Anakin Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi had ranks within the military. When he says that Balin wasn't the first Jedi to part ways with the Order a long time ago, he's referencing Darth Vader because Darth Vader and Thrawn knew each other when they were both serving under the Emperor. 
Thrawn had an interesting relationship with Darth Vader. Like, he wasn't afraid of Darth Vader, and Darth Vader generally didn't like Thrawn. He didn't really care about him that much. Like, he didn't really care about anybody. Both Darth Vader and Thrawn generally did not care about the Empire in a grand morality kind of sense. They were just tools that they used. When he says that Sabine will be of great use to them, Thrawn is talking about getting Ezra Bridger because, as he says later, he hasn't been able to track him down in all this time. He thinks he might be, like, he could be dead, but we haven't been able to find him. So he's hoping that Sabine will find Ezra, and then Balin's skull can find them and kill them. He also kind of throws them on the pile after this, too. Like, you know what? After they kill Ezra and Sabine, then we can also leave them behind in this galaxy, too. Like, who cares about those dark Jedi? Sabine fights the nomads Thrawn warned her about, just random people hunting anyone that comes along for supplies, showing more of her Mandalorian fighting skills. Also notice that the rocks around her have symbols carved into them, probably serving as road markers. When Thrawn starts talking about them losing a ton of troops since they've been stranded here, thus the need for the Night Sister zombies, which you see in the caskets being ferried from the catacombs, like those are all dead bodies that they'll resurrect when they get back to the main galaxy. There are a couple funny moments that Sabine has with her mount coming back to her like a scared puppy. It acts a little bit kind of like a loth wolf, looks like one too. And the funny thing too is that Balan Skull and Shin Hati, who are riding them later, they're actually named after wolves from Norse mythology, I believe. So they're like wolves riding wolves, basically. They meet the crab-like aliens that then take them to their settlement where Ezra Bridger has been living with them, like a nomadic species that just can move around from place to place so that he does not get captured. The Bakken Jedi that Balin says Ezra comes from after the fall of the Jedi Temple is basically Kanan Jarrus, like another Kanan reference. We saw a picture of him in the previous episodes inside the ghost ship, so maybe we'll see Freddie Prinze Jr. in like a bigger live-action cameo. But technically, he already had to film a scene so that they could take that picture, so you've already seen live-action Freddie Prinze Kanan, it's just in a picture. We get our big reunion between Sabine and Ezra Bridger. Their energy in live-action is a little bit like it was together during Star Wars Rebels, but remember, these are like brand new actors playing the characters, so they're kind of trying to recreate their energy from Star Wars Rebels. Sabine makes a Star Wars Rebels reference, and they play a little bit of music from Star Wars Rebels. Looks like he's wearing a chainmail shirt, and the scars on his face are actually from Star Wars Rebels. What'll probably happen, though, is that Shin Hati, Balin's skull will reach them in Episode 7, and they'll have a big fight, and it'll show you some of Ezra's new Force powers and abilities. Then the great mothers of the Night Sisters tell Thrawn about Ahsoka coming, and he orders Morgan Elsbeth to basically kill any Purgle that comes anywhere near the planet. Like I said, he doesn't really care about collateral damage, because he really only cares about saving his people. He doesn't mind killing a whole bunch of other people in the process of that. Literally, whatever it takes to accomplish his goal, it's kind of like an Ender's Game situation. Like, he doesn't mind sacrificing a bunch, a bunch, to achieve whatever his goal is. They make another Wheel of Time Great Thread reference. Like I said, the Great Thread that they're talking about, the strands, are basically the way that they perceive the Force. They're basically tapping into the Force the same way that Grogu, Luke Skywalker, all the other Jedi, the Sith, any other Force users like the Bendu, but just doing it in a slightly different way. So it gives them slightly different abilities and powers. Thrawn saying that death and resurrection are common misconceptions of the Jedi and the Night Sisters is another reference to the Night Sisters zombies that he plans on raising when they get back to the main galaxy. Also, when he says to the Great Mothers, I'll need your dark magic again. The magic literally is the thing that they will, that green energy. He orders information on Ahsoka's history, including her homeworld, her master, who is Anakin Skywalker, who Thrawn knew as Darth Vader. They knew each other, but I don't know if Thrawn knew that Anakin Skywalker became Darth Vader. They also covered a lot of Ahsoka's early history, like her birth, her home planet, during the Tales of the Jedi series. The other interesting thing is that in the credits, Sam Witwer is also credited during additional voices, meaning that he voiced either some of the droids, like maybe the golden droids on Morgan Elsbeth's ship, or some of the background voices, like when they held the chanting during the big Stormtrooper Legion scene. Sam Witwer is like all over the Ahsoka series, just like somewhere in the background where you can't actually see his face. Big things they're covering in Episode 7 will be that Ezra and Sabine versus Balin Skull Shin Hati fight, showing off some of his new powers, revealing more about Balin's true plans, like this mysterious power that's calling to him on the planet. Then Ahsoka also finally making it to the planet, like finding some way to make landfall before they're able to kill her. Probably revealing more lore behind the Night Sisters in this ancient witch kingdom of the Dathmiri and what was happening in this other galaxy, why they initially came to the brand new galaxy, like why travel between galaxies at all. Early theory is because of that green magic energy that they found on the Dathomir planet. That also probably has something to do with Balin Skull's true plans. There were so many Easter eggs and references during the episode. If you spotted any that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. Gonna Go Down is probably one of the best episodes so far. We'll see if they top this in the last two. 
My Ahsoka Episode 7 trailer video will post tomorrow and my full Episode 7 video will post next week after they release it. Click here for that Ahsoka Episode 7 video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that and click here for all my other Ahsoka videos. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and this is the way.